Well, thank you for the introduction. I'd also like to thank Piero for putting together this last festival. Um, it's truly an honor to be here um, to share with you some of our work in nanoscience. As was mentioned, my name is Jen Dion, and I'm an assistant professor of material science and engineering at Stanford University. Perhaps some of you noticed uh, the Mission Impossible theme of my title slide. I know the movie came out a couple of years back. Um, but today I'd like to share with you some technologies that at one point were thought to be in the realm of science fiction, but are now becoming a reality thanks to advances in nanoscience and nanoengineering. And a few of the technologies that I want to discuss today are how we can improve photovoltaic technology, so solar cells, the conversion of sunlight into electricity using nanomaterials. I also want to discuss a few medical treatments and cancer therapeutics that are simply based on light nanoparticle interactions rather than uh, drugs that might be toxic or nonspecific. Um, and then I also want to discuss a little bit about invisibility. How can we engineer light matter interactions to make like, um, objects invisible? So at Stanford, I run a team of physicists, uh, engineers, chemists, electrical um, engineers, um, all focused on understanding and controlling molecular and nanoscale systems using light. So we're very interested in how light interacts with different materials. And to give you a flavor for the sorts of questions that my students and I like to ponder upon on a given day, um, you guys asked us at least one question on graphene. Some of the questions that really motivate us are, first, can small molecules or proteins be optically imaged and manipulated? So using light microscopes, can we get to the point where we have a resolution comparable to electron microscopy? Something where you can just put your blood on the slide and image proteins or DNA on the slide using a light microscope. Another question we're really interested in is um, whether or not catalytic reactions can be observed at the single molecule or single particle level to better improve catalytic conversion efficiencies or to better understand chemical reactions. Can we get to the point where we're watching chemical reactions occur in real time and in situ? Another question that drives our research is can low energy photons be efficiently harvested in solar cells? I'll share with you today that somewhere between 30 and 50% of the sun's energy goes to waste in a conventional solar cell because that light can't be absorbed by the cell. So how can we engineer light matter interactions using new nanomaterials that can take those low energy transmitted photons and then convert them to an energy range that can be absorbed by the cell above it? to um, significantly increase solar cell efficiencies. And then the last question that um, is kind of fun and I think our group has an approach to answer is whether or not objects can be made invisible. So it's kind of the converse to the first question I posed. First of all, we want to make new materials that allow objects to become visible, like proteins or DNA, just by looking at them with a light microscope. But we can also use very similar materials to make objects invisible. So although these questions are seemingly diverse, it turns out that addressing them really requires new techniques to control the interaction of light with matter, both on a wavelength scale, so kind of a larger macroscopic scale, and also on a deeply sub-wavelength scale, so on a nano scale. A lot of times people will ask me, how did you get interested in nanoscience? And I didn't always want to be a nanoscientist. In fact, when I was a lot younger, my dreams were quite different. So this is me when I was four. And the first dream I had when I was really little was to be a skating magician. I grew up in Rhode Island, so on the East Coast, um, skating so much that even the ice and the snow didn't seem cold. And then my neighbors and I would often put on magic tricks for our parents. And I thought, how fun would it be if I got to combine two of my favorite hobbies, both ice skating um, and magic? Unfortunately, it turns out that pulling a rabbit out of the hat while trying to land an axle is a lot harder than I would have imagined, so I wasn't quite able to uh, pursue that dream. So after that, I moved on to plan B. Given my interest in performing at the time, and given the fact that I lived in Rhode Island, I'd be like, oh, it'd be so much fun to move to California, and I'd love to be a Hollywood star. I did get pretty close back in about 2002, 2003 when I got a call from a nearby agency, Caltech. <laughs> I don't know if uh, many of you for, are familiar with the pranks that Caltech puts on. They were able to black out the entire Hollywood sign. You can see it in the background here. And then just overlay it with the Caltech logo. So Caltech is where I did my PhD in applied physics. I graduated from Caltech in 2009. 
Um, and although um, the closest I got to be a movie star was just an extra in Numbers, which is filmed on campus, um, I did get to meet some science stars along the way. So Jamie and Adam from Mythbusters and um, Stephen Hawking. So it was a lot of fun doing my PhD there. Okay, so plan A and plan B didn't quite work out. Plan C, when I was younger, was to actually be a paranormal researcher. And this was a career goal I had for a good number of years. I really enjoyed watching the X-Files and Ghostbusters. Um, and I guess whenever there were like new episodes on, my parents definitely couldn't answer any of the questions about ghosts. They certainly couldn't answer my questions about science. So um, yeah, I guess I thought it'd be a lot of fun to investigate um, you know, that which couldn't be explained, in particular by my parents, um, and some paranormal activity. This may seem rather far-fetched, but in reality, I think a lot of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is kind of related to this dream I had when I was very little. Because in nanoscience, what we're really trying to do is explain what seemingly can't be explained right now and really see the unseen. So hopefully this gives you a little bit of a flavor of how I wound up going into science and in particular nanoscience. And I mentioned that a lot of our work um, investigates how light interacts with nanomaterials. Just to give you a little bit of an example or a flavor of how interesting this field can be, I want to show you um, an insect that you're probably quite familiar with, the blue morpho butterfly. In my opinion, this is a very vivid example of how light can interact with nano or microstructured materials. If you look at the wings of the blue morpho butterfly, there are a lot of browns and um, blacks that come from pigments, um, similar to the pigments that you would use to dye your clothes. But you also have this really vivid blue iridescent wing. And when I was little, I used to wonder, what is it that causes the blue iridescence? It turns out if you use an optical microscope to kind of zoom in to what's happening, you'll notice that the blue morpho butterfly and butterflies in general have wings that are composed of multiple scales. And zooming in a little bit further, there are kind of scales upon scales all layered up, in some species up to 12 different layers of scales. If you try to zoom in any further using an optical microscope, you'll run into what's called the diffraction limit. It's very hard to image objects comparable to the size of the wavelength of light. So instead, you can use an electron microscope, since electrons are much smaller than photons, and you'll get a better sense for the structure of individual scales. So each of these scales is composed of chitin. It's basically a transparent polymer derived from glucose. So this is really important. These blue scales are composed of a completely transparent natural material. And just by virtue of how these scales are structured, zooming in a little bit further, You'll notice that there's um, a periodicity, kind of a ladder-like structure to this transparent material. And the periodicity is on the order of a micron, which is comparable to the wavelength of visible light. So simply by taking this transparent material, structuring it on the order of the wavelength of sunlight that's incident on the butterfly wings, you wind up getting this really beautiful iridescent blue reflection. For those of you um, not too familiar with the spectrum of visible light, typically blue light has a wavelength of around 400 nanometers, so you can think about the size of a blue photon being about 400 nanometers. Red light has a wavelength of around 700 nanometers. Our eyes can generally perceive up to about 780 nanometers. So between about 400 to 780 nanometers is the wavelength range or the photon size range to which our eyes are sensitive. So hopefully that example motivates that when you start to microstructure materials, you can get some very unusual optical properties. Here's another example, not so much with microstructuring, but more with nanostructuring. And let's consider just a metal, like bulk silver, which is typically used in a mirror, right? Silver is shiny, it's reflective. But if you take bulk silver and nanostructure it such that now you have silver nanoparticles with sizes on the order of about 10 nanometers, maybe up to 100 nanometers, and then you look at how those particles scatter light, you can get a whole rainbow of colors that are scattered from the same material, silver, except now the same material appears different colors based upon its size. So it scatters different colors based upon its size. The smaller ones scatter more in the blue, the larger ones tend to scatter more in the red or in the orange. 
This sort of nanostructuring of metals has been used by one of my students who's in the back, Brian Baum, to create something akin to stained glass windows. And it turns out, if you go back in history, a lot of the Roman artisans were making stained glass windows just based on uh, metal impurities that were already in the glass. So most stained glass windows do have metal nanoparticles in it that give rise to the very vivid colors that you'll see in them. One of my other friends and colleagues, Kate Nichols, who's a TED fellow and also an artist, has used these silver nanoparticles to create macroscopic art. Um, some of her art is on display in various museums throughout the Bay Area and also in Salt Lake City. Um, so this is a large Victorian style mirror where all of the different colors in the paint come from just her synthesizing silver nanoparticles of different sizes and then them resonating different colors or scattering different colors um, when white light is incident on them. She also helped us paint the cover um, of a scientific article that we published in Nature um, earlier last year. So that was metals. I also want to give you a second example with semiconducting nanomaterials. So semiconductors are kind of the core for, uh, or the core material that we'll use in all of our transistors and cell phones and computers today. Um, typically, most of our uh, transistors are based on silicon, but cadmium sulfide is another good example, semiconducting material characterized by a dance gap. So bulk cadmium sulfide, at least in its kind of powdery form, um, sometimes you can buy it at Michael's, um, it's called cadmium yellow. It basically appears yellow and you can use it as a pigment in the cafe terrace at night by Van Gogh. Um, this was the pigment he used, cadmium sulfide. So a semiconductor powder basically dispersed in an oil medium. If you make a cadmium sulfide nanocrystal, I want to show you some of the really cool optical properties that can result. Here's a transmission electron micrograph image of a nanoparticle that's roughly about two to three nanometers across. So here's the scale bar indicating two nanometers. We're viewing this in an electron microscope, so it's a projection of a three-dimensional spherical nanoparticle in 2D, and each of the white dots you see corresponds to a column of atoms that the electron beam is passing across. So here's cadmium sulfide nanoparticles that we've synthesized in our lab that are just about two to three nanometers across. Just like in the bulk powder form, they appear kind of yellow. But then if you look at their fluorescence, so if you were just to put a black light beneath them, they can fluoresce green. And in fact, they can fluoresce pretty much any color simply based upon their size. So as you structure their size from smaller to larger, you can get that fluorescence to span colors um, all the way from blue, again, up to red, um, even into the near infrared. So hopefully this has driven home the point that nanomaterials have some very interesting optical properties. I want to spend a little bit of time showing you how they're made. In our lab, we use basically two different techniques to create new optical nanomaterials, one of which is kind of a bottom-up assembly or an atom-by-atom -atom assembly. I'll show you a quick video. So here we're just taking a metal salt precursor and then mixing it into an aqueous solution with some stabilizing ligands or surfactants, kind of like a detergent. And atom by atom, this metal um, salt precursor is decomposing and then the metal atoms are attaching uh, growing nanoparticles of different sizes. Again, we have a demonstration table in the back to show you part of the synthesis. And as the particles are growing larger and larger, you can see how the scattering um, is shifting more to the red part of the visible spectrum. So this is how you make simple nanoparticles. A lot of our research also relies upon collections of nanoparticles, so not just one nanoparticle, but how you can, say, tether groups of nanoparticles together to get some pretty unusual properties. And to do that, we'll usually use things like protein-directed assembly or DNA-directed assembly, where we can take these nanoparticles um, attach them to say a single strand of DNA and then have the complementary strand of DNA on another particle come in and bind, giving you a very precise interparticle separation and a very precise arrangement of particles on the nanoscale. A second technique that you might use to create nanomaterials is more of a top-down approach. So rather than relying on atom-by-atom -atom assembly of nanoparticles, you can take a bulk material, 
and then mill parts of it away or etch parts of it away to create very unique two-dimensional and three-dimensional structures. Um, so here are just two examples using focused ion beam milling, and here you can see the scale bar is around five microns, here it's around two microns. The critical feature sizes in each of these uh, nanostructures is on the order of um, about 10 nanometers. So if you rely on top-down assembly, you can pattern features with dimensions on the order of 10 or so nanometers. Okay, so what are they useful for? I just want to mention a few applications that my group is very interested in for nanomaterials. Um, and the first is in photovoltaic technologies or in solar cells, so conversion of sunlight into electricity. And as many of you know, the sun delivers more energy to the earth in an hour than humans use in an entire year. So it's enormous, an enormous source of renewable clean energy. But unfortunately, most photovoltaic cells can only use a small fraction of on the sun spectrum. And that's in part because only 5% of the sun's light is in the visible, 43% is in, or 5% is in the ultraviolet, 43% is in the visible, and 52% is in the infrared. And most solar cells can't efficiently absorb this infrared light. That's because they're based on semiconductors that have a band gap. And if photons don't have a high enough energy to cross that band gap, they won't be absorbed. Instead, they'll simply be transmitted. So as mentioned here, sunlight outside of that visible frequency range, so towards longer wavelengths or more infrared wavelengths, is usually very poorly absorbed in solar cells and is simply just transmitted. So cells at these longer wavelengths are transparent. What our group is working on is a technology called upconversion, where we can place a material behind the solar cell, separated by a simple insulating layer that can take these lower energy transmitted photons and combine them together um, to make a photon that has a sufficiently high energy to cross the band gap of the cell above it. And then we direct those photons back towards the cell so it can be absorbed and then contribute to photocurrent or contribute to production of electricity. And to give you an example of this sort of material, here's uh, one material that's converting infrared light, so our eyes are not sensitive to infrared light, and it's being converted into green light. We have some of these materials in the back if you're interested in seeing them. Um, they have reasonable efficiencies right now on the order of 20%. Um, and if you calculate how much a solar cell would improve its efficiency, as a function of the band gap, so as a function of what photon energies that solar cell can absorb, you'll notice that without the up converter, the maximum thermodynamic efficiency that a solar cell could achieve is about 30%. So a single junction cell can only be about 30% efficient. But if you add this up converting layer behind the cell, simply by spray casting or painting these up converting layers behind it, that efficiency can improve to over 44%. And this is a technology that we're working on in our lab, and we're also collaborating with scientists at Bosch to place it um, behind some of their research and commercial cells. I also want to mention that even though the efficiencies of upconverting materials on their own are only about 20%, we want to make them higher. Can we get to the point where all of those transmitted photons can be absorbed by the upconverter and then convert into higher energy photons? So we're working on nanostructured films and nanostructured uh, materials that can essentially act as nano antennas to direct that low energy photon uh, light to the up converter and then redirect the up converted light back towards the solar cell. And in our lab, uh, some of our preliminary results have shown that we can improve up conversion efficiencies um, by roughly five to 100 X, depending upon which up converting material we start with. So we're getting to the point where it is becoming a viable technology for commercial applications. Okay, I talked a little bit about solar applications. I want to talk a little bit about bio as well. Here's a picture of kinesin. Kinesin is basically a molecular motor um, that's important for um, transporting a number of important cargo within cells. For example, neurotransmitters and chromosomes. And it does so by basically walking along these microtubules within our cells using something like a hand-over-hand -hand motion. So right now, as you're listening to me speak, kinesin is basically walking along microtubules in your neurons, allowing you to process the information that I'm saying. 
And unfortunately, this is a cartoon because we can't directly image what kinesin is doing. We don't have um, optical microscopes that allow us to image these motor proteins in vivo and in real time to really get a flavor for how these motor proteins are working or how the machinery of our cells are working. However, about five to 10 years ago, Steve Block, one of my colleagues at Stanford, developed a relatively ingenious way of uh, unraveling the motion of kinesin by basically taking this protein that's about four by seven nanometers across and tethering it to a large polymeric bead about half a micron across. And then he could use a very tightly focused laser beam, much like the laser pointer I have, and trap that polymeric bead. So lasers can be used to trap objects that are about the wavelength of light based upon how the electric field intensity varies as a function of space. It's something called optical tweezing. So you can use a tightly focused laser beam to trap a bead that's about the wavelength of light and then move that bead around. So he tethered this 500 nanometer bead to kinesin and then was able to pull on the bead a little bit and see how the kinesin reacted. And from that, he was able to unravel this kind of hand over hand motion of the protein. What our group is interested in doing is extending optical tweezing technology and also optical imaging technology such that we don't have to rely on tethering this small little seven nanometer protein to a bead that's hundreds of times larger. We'd much rather just be able to take our tightly focused laser beam and trap the protein on its own or trap just the head and see how it's moving. And then not only trap the structure, but be able to manipulate it and move it around. So if a motor protein happened to be moving the wrong way along the microtubule, it could go back the other way if you were to just direct it with your laser. And then also image what that protein is doing directly. So send light in and then be able to directly image what that protein is doing. So our group has recently designed a new optical tweezer where you just take your tightly focused laser beam and then you send it through a small coaxial uh, nanostructure. Um, this is almost like the miniaturized version of the BNC cables or coaxial cables that you might use at um, home on your television. And when focus light gets sent through this um, structure that's about 150 nanometers um, in length and roughly about 200 nanometers in diameter with a 20 nanometer channel, Basically, it excites a collective motion of the electrons at the metal dielectric interface and scatters light in such a way out the opposite end that you can get very precisely sculpted electromagnetic fields that focus the light to an even smaller spot size than the diffraction limit. And that spot size is just a few nanometers across and produces a very deep potential well that allows you to trap a two nanometer protein um, that would be in water. Um, so right now we're working on um, experiments to uh, demonstrate this technology. We also have a patent on it, um, but it's this sort of coaxial tweezer that is going to allow us to directly manipulate individual kinesin proteins and also image them in cells. Another biological example I want to tell you about is um, a new cancer therapy using gold nanoparticles and light. So generally, um, Cancer chemotherapies rely on molecules, something like cisplatin. It's composed of a heavy metal um, core, and then uh, basically chlorine and ammonia groups. And this single molecule can enter your cell, bind to DNA, cause DNA to kink, and then that kink in DNA basically prevents replication. The problem with cisplatin as a chemotherapeutic drug is that it's very nonspecific. So it'll bind nonspecifically to any of your DNA, and it also is composed of a heavy metal platinum. So because of the non-specificity of this um, molecular drug, and because it has a heavy um, metal atomic core, there are typically a lot of deleterious side effects of conventional chemotherapeutic um, drugs. So as an alternate, some of my colleagues have worked on um, synthesizing gold nanoparticles that can not only allow you to image the tumors, um, and diagnose tumors, but also enable photothermal therapy. And unlike platinum, which is a heavy metal, gold is actually quite biocompatible, and you may have even eaten it on some fancier pastries. So here's a schematic, slightly graphic, I apologize, illustrating how the technology works. And I'll just mention that this is in the final stages of FDA approval for a breast cancer treatment. So it's a nanoparticle that's composed of a silica core 
um, surrounded by a gold shell. This nanoparticle geometry was pioneered by Hollis and Wentz at Rice University. And by virtue of the core shell structure of this nanoparticle, um, it resonantly absorbs light in the near infrared. So I mentioned at the very beginning when we had metal nanoparticles that could preferentially scatter light in the blue or scatter light in the red based on their size. These are nanoparticles that can preferentially scatter light um, and absorb light in the near infrared. And that's important because the near infrared is a region of transparency for our tissue. If you were to take a flashlight and hold it up to your hand and look at the other side, you'd notice that a lot of the red light is coming through. So red light and near infrared light can pass through our tissues four or five times deeper than visible light. So these structures resonantly absorb that near infrared light and it turns out that when light is incident on this nanoparticle, um, light is so attracted to the nanoparticle that the shadow that gets cast by the nanoparticle can be about 20 times larger than the physical size of the nanoparticle. So a lot of light gets focused onto the particle and it turns out that creates very intense electric fields near the nanoparticle that kind of locally heat up the molecules surrounding the particle. So infrared light comes in, you wind up with these very intense electromagnetic fields that heat up the surrounding molecules and the surrounding cells. And then the cells, when they're sufficiently hot, will basically pop open, so killing the cancer cell. So um, what can be done is you can take these gold nanoparticles and functionalize them with specific proteins or specific flags that can recognize certain types of cancer. And then you inject these nanoparticles, that was first done with mice, um, that have localized tumors. Um, so the particles go in, and because tumors are sinks for blood flow, the particles naturally go towards the tumor, and then they also selectively bind to those cancer cells based upon the specific protein flags that you have to identify the um, tumor or the cancer. And then initially the mouse underwent treatment for about an hour a day where they were just illuminated with an infrared LED. And then after about two weeks of this treatment, the mice were completely cancer free and they remained that way for the rest of their natural lifespan. So it's a very non-toxic photothermal way, um, I think, of treating cancer. And like I said, um, it's pretty exciting that this is in the final stages of um, FDA treatment um, or FDA trial and approval for breast cancer. Okay, so in the final few minutes of my talk, I want to shift from biology into something a little bit more exotic, invisibility. A lot of people um, get excited about some of the materials we make because they can be used to make objects invisible. And unlike H.G. Wells' Invisible Man, where um, here the protagonist was able to become invisible by changing the refractive index of his body to equal that of air, we'd rather make an invisibility cloak more like Harry Potter's that can be taken on or put on and taken off um, easily so that way you don't wind up going on the and killing yourself. <laughs> so how do invisibility cloaks work on paper? Well, if you consider a light source, just like a light bulb, it's radiating light rays, shown here in red, in an isotropic way around the light source. So here you can just follow the light rays going out, and if we're an observer down here at the bottom, basically we can uh, see light rays coming towards our eye. If we put an object in the center, you'll notice that some of these light rays get bounced back. Also, some don't get transmitted through the object, essentially casting a shadow. So as an observer, that's how we detect objects, either by the scattering um, or by the shadow cast by the object. An invisibility cloak could work um, by surrounding the object and steering the light rays around the object such that the light never interacts with it and then emerges on the other side as if light has simply passed through free space. And this is just a simple ray optics perspective of how a cloak might work, but you can see how some of these rays that kind of come in get um, deflected a little bit to the left and a little bit to the right being steered around the object. And you can basically map out what those refraction angles need to be or what the refractive index gradient needs to be to get light to flow smoothly around an object without ever, ever interacting with it and then emerging on the other side as if light has simply passed through free space. You'll also notice that none of the light rays get reflected, so an observer over here also would not see the object. It turns out that the refractive index profile needed to do this 
is one such that the index of the material has to be less than one. So it has to be less than air. And then you also nominally want to be able to tune that refractive index to be close to zero. And in some cases, even negative. And unfortunately, nature doesn't provide us such negative refractive index materials at optical frequencies. So what we have to do is go back to the lab and say, OK, why doesn't nature give us those materials? And then two, can we make them in the lab? It turns out that the laws of physics don't prevent a negative index material from existing at visible frequencies. It's just that it's really hard because at very high frequencies, the magnetic response of materials is very weak. I'll just though give you a few photorealistic simulations of what these materials would look like if we could make them. So here's a simulation of just a straw in water. Water has a refractive index of about 1.3. And you'll notice that the straw is positively refracted across the air-water interface. Um, and it also looks a little bit bent or kinked um, right at that interface. If you were to replace water that has an index of 1.3 with artificial water that has an index very close to zero, you'll notice here it looks a little bit more like a mirror. And if water were to have a negative refractive index, you'll notice negative refraction at the air-water interface You'll also see that you can no longer observe the bottom of the glass of water. It's almost as if you're an observer looking at the glass um, from below, even though you're an observer at eye level or just above the glass. Um, I want to give you also one more quick uh, simulation of what motion would look like if we lived in this negative index world. So if we were to drop a ball into positive index water, here you can see the ball in air, there it fell into water, and it just simply looks like it's getting smaller with depth. So as the ball is going deeper into water, um, it looks like it's getting smaller. If that water were to be negative index water, here the ball is in air, now it falls into the water. Even though it's getting deeper, it kind of looks like the ball is moving towards you until it looks like it becomes infinitely big. That's actually part of what we use for the imaging technology. And then it's a critical depth. It then appears to be getting a lot smaller. So we've been able to engineer these materials by creating kind of artificial metamaterial atoms. So new atoms that have both a very strong electric response, just like natural materials at optical frequencies, and also a very strong magnetic response. So we need basically the electrons in our materials to be like miniature circulating current loops to be able to create a negative refractive index at visible wavelengths. So the meta atoms that we've been focusing on are these little nano crescents. Um, here you can see they support a circulating uh, displacement loop. So it's kind of like a miniature current loop that gets you the magnetic response that you need for a negative index material. And then there's also a strong electric dipolar response across the tip of this nanostructure that's composed of a tapered metallic shell and a dielectric sphere of the core. <clears throat> and if you look at the refractive index as a function of wavelength, it can be negative over hundreds of nanometers in the visible and near infrared spectrum. And we can also tune the index quite well um, by changing the geometry of this crescent. We can kind of tune the index um, arbitrarily at any wavelength to be any value. So this would be the building block for such an invisibility code. OK, I know I only have a few more minutes left. I've talked a lot about the far field optical properties of these nanomaterials. We talked a little bit about the stained glass windows, a little bit about the Victorian glasses that my friend and colleague Kate Nichols makes using nanoparticles. Then we talked about how we can use nanomaterials in photovoltaics to improve their efficiency, how we can use nanomaterials to trap and image individual proteins and DNA, um, and then how nanomaterials can be used to make objects invisible. But what is it that a photon sees when it encounters a nanomaterial. So if we were to put ourselves inside this nanomaterial, what would light look like circulating inside one of these nanostructures that's smaller than the wavelength of light? I don't have time to go into the technical details, but my group has developed a technique to visualize light-matter interactions in three dimensions with nanometer scale resolution so we can precisely understand how light is interacting with these nanomaterials. And this is um, an experimental reconstruction of that tomogram. If you want to think a little bit about like MRI tomography, it's just like that, uh, very similar, except that this is on the nanoscale and looking at light instead of magnetic resonance.
So here at a wavelength of 470 nanometers, we're looking at how this wavelength white light would interact with that nanocrescent I just showed you that has a polymeric core and the metallic shell. And then in this video, I'll sweep through the different wavelengths so you can get a flavor for how light um, would interact with this metamaterial atom. So different wavelengths like prefers to be localized at the base of the crescent, and longer wavelengths like prefers to be localized at the tips of the crescent. You can also look at kind of a fly through of this nanostructure. Where on the left hand side you'll see um, with the metal and the dielectric structural landscape, and then on the right hand side you'll see how photons with a wavelength of 850 nanometers would interact with this structure. So it's two-dimensional cross-sections of this crescent. Here you can see light really doesn't want to be in the core of the crescent. It'd much rather be at the tips or at the base. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions, but I will end with a quote by Robert Pullen that says, if we wish to make a new world, we have the material ready. I'd like to modify that a little bit by saying we have the nanomaterial ready. By creating new materials in our lab, I think we have a plethora of very unique ways of tuning light matter interactions for applications ranging from solar energy to biology to invisibility. And I'd be happy to take any questions.